This video provides a tutorial for each developer weapon found within the world of Dying Light 2. I'm going to show you how to get the item, what the item actually does, and share some general advice about using it. Basically, just everything you need to know about each item. I'm going to cover each weapon in chronological order, so the order in which you're actually able to obtain it in the game, but feel free to use the timestamps and the comments in the description to skip to the part that interests you. And also, I'm going to be doing my best to keep this guide spoiler free, so you you don't have to worry about spoilers. Now the last thing I want to say before I get into the first weapon is that unfortunately, the easter eggs in Dying Light 2 are very glitchy at the moment, and for some people, they simply don't work. I was unlucky enough to be one of those people where half of the items just don't load in my game. The way I solved this was by joining a friend's game and getting the item in their world. It sucks, but that's just the current state of the game. Now, if any weapons don't spawn for you, uh, and you don't have a friend to play with, join the official Dying Light 2 Discord server and find some people to play with there. I'm sure they'll be happy to lend a hand, and I'll leave a link to that in the description. Alright, the first developer weapon that you can obtain in Dying Light 2 is the Shocker, and it's available as soon as you've completed the prologue and have been granted access to the open world. If you make your way to this location in the northern end of Old Villador, you'll come across a fenced off area with a soccer ball and a goalpost. In order to unlock the shocker, you need to score six goals with the football, but the catch is that you have to leave the area and come back for each goal. If you're going to do this later in the game, the fastest way to leave the area is just to fast travel away and then make your way back, and if you're doing this at the beginning of the game, simply just run away to a different zone and come back. Now when you do come back after scoring each goal, the soccer ball should now be respawned in a different position than when you last kicked it. If it is respawned in the exact same part of the field where you kicked it from the previous time, then I'm sorry, but the easter egg just isn't working in your game. If it is working, you should see some sparks of electricity when you score your third goal, and when you score the sixth goal, you'll see the same effect before the shocker weapon spawns in front of you. The shocker is a relatively low damage weapon, which is why I recommend getting it early in the game. It's not really going to compare to the damage of the weapons you get towards the end of the game, but it definitely can give you a significant boost early on, primarily because the weapon already has the spark mod added to the tip and the shaft of the weapon, which produces a chain lightning effect that deals electricity to groups of zombies on critical hits. By the way, you don't get the blueprint for the shocker weapon, and it only spawns once, so what you can do, which I did in this case, I joined my friend to do it because it didn't work in my game, and then we dropped it on the ground and both picked it up at the same exact time. That way you both get a copy of the weapon and everyone's happy. The next easter egg is a continuation of the shocker and it gets you the united in fun soccer ball. After you've gotten the shocker weapon, score just 3 more goals for a total of 9 goals. Keeping in mind that once again you need to leave the area after each goal and the ball should respawn in a different location every time. Once you've scored your total of 9 goals, you'll see some more bursts of electricity around the goalpost and then something quite bizarre happens. Dispatch the goon, and at the goalpost, a blueprint will spawn for the United in Fun Soccer Ball. The Soccer Ball overall is just an item for fun, it's not really going to benefit you in any kind of way. All you want to do with it is, I guess, play a game of football with your friends in co-op. Outside of that, it doesn't really serve any purpose, it doesn't deal any damage, you can only use it once. Once you throw it on the ground, you cannot pick it back up, and it costs like 369 scraps to make, so not really worth it in the grand scheme of things, but it is a fun little item. Once again, it doesn't damage zombies, it doesn't even stun them, but one thing I did notice is that sometimes it does serve as a slight distraction for zombies, so that's pretty interesting. Next up, we've got the Marion Boots. Now, you can obtain these Mario-inspired kicks from this location in the Central Loop map. Make your way to the Renegade Stronghold, which, by the way, you can just completely ignore. You don't have to capture the camp in order to get the boots. So, make your way carefully and avoid the dangerous chemicals and head into this shipping container, which is locked. Inside this shipping container, you'll find some Easter eggs relating to Kyle Crane from the first game and a place where you can sit down. So, sit down for about a minute and 
wait for the boots to magically appear right in front of the crane memorial. It's not a blueprint, it's just the boots themselves. Now if you've sat down for a minute and nothing has happened, unfortunately your game is probably glitched and you'll need to join someone else and obtain it from their world. Now, the description of these boots, along with every YouTube video made about them, is kind of misleading. They're not going to allow you to perform an actual triple jump. Instead, there's a special effect that triggers every time you perform three consecutive jumps where you get to see a headless Aiden in third person do a flip and laugh. By the way, little known fact about these boots, they actually allow you to jump higher than your regular jump, including the high jump skill that you unlock in the first part of the parkour tree during the prologue. The next developer item you can obtain is the Casper's Slippers. Now, the requirements for spawning these in are definitely the most vague of any item in this video, so start by heading to the fish eye in the central loop and going to the little safe house that contains the bed and the player stash. This is where the flip flops should spawn, right next to a poster of the Great Escape. Now if the poster and the flip flops aren't there in your game, then either one of two things has happened, either you haven't met the requirements yet, or your game is simply glitched out. If the soccer ball and the Mario boots didn't work for you then your game is probably glitched and you'll have to get these in co-op. Uh, the good thing is that these do respawn so if you do have a friend who it's working for they can get multiple pairs and they can just share one with you. But if the soccer ball and the Mario boots did work for you but these haven't spawned yet then there's a couple different things you can try. The first is completing the book club quest chain which is available from the PK floating fortress after you've completed the welcome aboard quest. West. Countless people have reported that the Casper's flip-flops spawned in for them after completing the book club quest chain, especially since the Great Escape poster is a reference to the book and the movie of the same name, which comes up during that quest line. There are also plenty of people who've said they've gotten the slippers without even touching this quest, but since everything about this item so far is purely anecdotal, it's absolutely worth a try. You can also try just generally completing all the side quests and side activities in the area, but Honestly, at that point, it'd just be easier to have someone join your game and drop the flip-flops in front of you. Now that we've established how to get the flip-flops, what do they actually do? Well, this is another item where there is unfortunately a lot of clickbait on YouTube claiming that these shoes make you immune to fall damage, which is just not true, okay? If you jump off the VNC tower with these, you will die. What this item actually does is two different things. One, it gives you the active landing perk, not to be confused with safe landing, which is the upgraded version. So even if you have a fresh level one character and someone joins your game and gives you a pair of these flip-flops, you will temporarily have access to the active landing skill. And number two, it removes the need for you to time a button press in order to use active landing. Your character will now auto roll when they fall from that kind of distance. So if you have a fresh level one character that doesn't have active landing, it will give you active landing. And if your character already has active landing or already has safe landing, it will scale accordingly and it just removes the need to press the button. I've tested this out extensively on a fresh level one character, on a low level character that only has active landing and on a high level character character that has both active landing and safe landing. So this is definitely what the flip-flops do. I don't want to see any more clickbait, all right? I hope that's clear. All right, next up, we've got the Cyber Hands 2177, AKA the Mantis Blades from Cyberpunk 2077. Now, although it is possible, you're gonna have a really hard time accessing this Easter egg if you haven't completed the broadcast story quest. So I recommend that you wait until you've progressed until that point and you now have easy access to the VNC tower rooftop via the elevator. Simply use your paraglider to get on top of this building near the VNC tower and talk to the mysterious man next to the bonfire. If he's not here, your game is unfortunately glitched. Once you've talked to the stranger, he gives you the blueprint for the weapon and that's it, nice and simple for once. Now the Cyber Hands 2177 don't deal particularly high amounts of damage, but they do produce an electric shock effect on every single hit. That's right, not just critical hits, this works on every single punch. It's not a chain lightning effect like the Shocker, but it is a good way of stunning one enemy at a time and getting them onto the ground. And by far the best way to use this weapon is to combo it with the Stomp ability. Oh yeah, it's time for the Korek Charm. This is by far one of the most useful items in the entire 
game. Just like with the Cyberpunk Claws, you're going to want to complete this easter egg after you've done the broadcast story quest. And it's also going to make your life a hell of a lot easier if you have the safe landing perk unlocked. What you want to do is fly from the VNC tower rooftop to this building nearby and grab the power cable. From here, drop down two floors, but do it one floor at a time. And if you don't have the safe landing perk, you won't survive these drops. You can use the grappling hook, and if you're using keyboard and mouse, you can kind of use the paraglider. Um, unfortunately, the paraglider is not really an option if you're using a controller, because the button that you hold to deploy the paraglider is the same button that releases the cable. So you want to hold on to that cable and safely make your way down two floors and plug in the cable. Once you've done that, turn around on that same floor and grab the second cable at the other side. Now. This is where you'll find out if the easter egg is glitched for you. If it is glitched, you won't be able to grab the second cable. Instead, it will say no power for some reason, which has nothing to do with the nearby electrical substation. The game is just glitched, and this is what happened in my game. I was pretty frustrated with this, but luckily I was able to join a friend and get the blueprints anyway. Anyway, if the easter egg is working for you, just follow along until you reach the keypad and a set of double doors. If you've linked up all three cables, you should now have access to the tech land room. Watch out for the bomber, by the way. If you go straight ahead, you'll see a TV, a coffee table with a thank you letter from the developers, and a bunch of seats. What you want to do is sit in each of those seats for one minute, and the Korak Charm Blueprint will spawn next to the letter on the table. As I mentioned earlier, the Korak Charm is by far one of the most useful items in the entire game. In Dying Light 2, you can't just infinitely repair your weapons. You can add modifications that extend the life of your weapons, but they will eventually break. The Korak Charm kind of bypasses that whole system. You can apply it to any weapon that has a charm slot, and it will instantly repair that weapon to full durability. But here's the thing, there is no limit to how many times you can do this. The charm has unlimited uses. Equip it to repair your weapon, unequip it, drain the durability some more on that weapon with some fighting, and then you just re-equip the charm to repair your weapon, and so on and so forth. You never have to say goodbye to a weapon again. By the way, Techland have confirmed that this is the intended use of the item. It was created by a developer named Korak, who is infamous for sneaking things into his games to make it a little bit easier during test runs, and then he leaves them in the final version. Uh, Techland have confirmed they're not going to patch this, they're not going to take it away from you. This is working as in intended and they're not going to take it away from you so you can enjoy those infinite repairs if that's what you're after. Now, in the same Techland room as the Korak Charm, there is the left finger of Glover. Once you've gotten the Korak Charm, make your way over to this room and sit on the bed for a few minutes. The longer you sit, the more teddy bears will spawn, and eventually the poster on the wall in front of you turns into the original Techland logo, and the blueprint will appear in front of you. The left finger of Glover is such a cool weapon, and it's probably the closest thing we have to a gun in the game. It has decent range, it deals good damage, it makes enemies go flying back, so in most cases they fall off a building and they die from the fall damage anyway, and it randomly applies any elemental effect to the enemy that you're shooting, so it could shock them, it could poison them, or it could even set them on fire. The only downside is that you only get 16 shots. Once you use up that 16 ammo, the weapon is destroyed, you can't use it anymore, and you have to spend a pretty high number of scraps to craft another one. Next up, we've got what is by far the most powerful weapon in the entire game. Talking about the Kaboom Shotgun. Now, once you've done the broadcast main story quest, you'll gain access to a Doom Easter Egg, and in order to access that, you need to collect five black rubber ducks around the world of Dying Light 2. There's one in the office at the top of the VNC tower, locked in a safe with the code 666. You can complete this while you're doing the main broadcast quest. There's one low located next to the dam, right on the border of the newfound Lost Lands. One hidden inside the trunk of a car behind a GRE Anomaly Arena in the top left corner of the wharf section of Central Loop. There's one located in Toxic Chemicals outside the Houndfield section of Old Villador. Gotta be quick for this one. <laughs> and 
and finally, one near the observatory also surrounded by toxic chemicals. Once you've collected all five ducks, take the elevator to the basement level of the VNC tower and travel in a straight line until you come across this spooky looking corridor with an elevator at the end. Take the elevator down to the doom room where you'll see five pedestals, each with two power cable stations behind them. Place all five ducks on the pedestals and then draw a pentagram by connecting the cables to the terminal opposite them. Once the pentagram is complete, you'll have access to the Doom Combat Challenge via the shotgun in the middle of the room. It's a pretty fun challenge, and as a bonus, you get to keep the insanely overpowered Doom shotgun simply by quitting your game in the middle of the challenge. Just make sure you have a free slot in your inventory. Once again, it's by far the most powerful weapon in the game, and it even one-shots volatiles. But the way that you get this isn't really intentional, so it might be patched at some point. But while you're here doing the Doom Challenge, there's two more blueprints you can unlock. The first one is Dying Force. So once you're inside the Doom Challenge, follow the path to the right until you end up in this room with green acid. In the corridor ahead, there's a false wall on the right hand side that you can activate by getting close to it and holding the interact button. Just follow the path through that hidden doorway and you'll see the Dying Force blueprint just sitting there. The Dying Force is such a fascinating weapon. It doesn't deal any direct damage, it just stuns the enemy, and this works on multiple enemies as long as they're bunched together. It works a whole lot better on humans than it does with the zombies, because with zombies it just kind of mesmerizes them for a moment, but with humans it's full on Star Wars the Force, just choking them for quite a decent chunk of time. This leaves them stunned and vulnerable to a whole string of follow-up attacks of your choice. I personally love comboing it with the dropkick because it looks so damn cool. But you do want to keep in mind that one, any damage will interrupt the effect, and two, it does not discriminate. If you are aiming it like I am here at some renegades and some PKs, it's going to work on all of them. As long as they're bunched together, all of them are going to be choked. And lastly, just like the left finger of Glover, this weapon only has 16 ammo, so you want to make the most of it because once again, it's kind of costly when it comes to using scraps to craft it. The second blueprint that can be found inside the Doom Challenge is the Mistress Sword, so follow the same path as last time, but when you get to that corridor with the false panel, take a left instead. You'll find a bomber in a corner next to the Mistress Sword blueprint. Now the Mistress Sword is of course a reference to Zelda, and also a reference to the Twilight Phantom easter egg in Dying Light 1. As of right now, the weapon does zero damage. It's kind of a waste of scraps, it's just something to play around with for fun, but it did remind me that Dying Light 1 had a similar weapon called the Anti-Gadoid Gun, which also did zero damage, until they introduced a new easter egg in the following expansion that transformed the weapon entirely. So perhaps there's still hope for the Mistress Sword. Although I will say, you can use the sword to knock zombies into walls, which causes damage, and not to mention you can use it to push zombies into spikes, and it even drains the stamina of the enemy that you're attacking, eventually leaving them stunned and vulnerable to follow up attacks, and if you really try hard enough, you can cut off zombies' limbs, which does kill them if you chop off both arms. So although it technically can kill enemies, it's just not very effective at it. Next up, we've got the Pan of Destiny. Now this easter egg can only be completed after you've finished the game. So once you've completed the main story, return to the Colonel's Renegade base and retrace your steps as you can see that I'm doing on screen. Just follow along and eventually you'll end up in a room with a bunch of easter egg posters and a talking chicken. The chicken asks you to fetch a piece of equipment which is relatively close by, and once you return, he'll teleport away and leave you with a gift. The Pan of Destiny is a throwable weapon with unlimited uses. It has a surprisingly long range, but it deals very little damage and takes a good chunk of time to kill even one zombie. Although I will say, 
it's quite effective at taking down drowners and bombers from a safe distance. Alright, that's pretty much it for the main weapons of this guide, but there are three more bonus items that I want to cover that right now you can only access through glitching the game. These three items are the hoverboard, the flying broom, and the bicycle. Let's start with the hoverboard. It's a pretty cool item and it all starts at the Church of St. Thomas the Apostle. You'll find a power cable there that you have to connect to the power terminal up in the bell room at the top. And then this will then power the radio upstairs. Listen to the radio message and afterwards interact with the hoverboard that spawns next to you. From here you want to use your survivor sense and follow a trail of footsteps and along the way you're going to find three more hoverboards. One at the end of this alleyway, one on the bridge and one next to this building. Now if you keep following the trail of footsteps you'll end up at the trunk of a car which contains a parkour challenge. Start the hoverboard challenge and simply quit the game to keep it in your inventory. The hoverboard is pretty much a reskinned paraglider with three key differences. Number one, it lets you ride on the surface of water. Number two, you can just use it on the ground. And number three, it has a much stronger sense of gravity. So you're not going to be able to get as high, but air vents do still boost you and restore your stamina. Now that you've got the hoverboard, let's talk about the flying broom, which is probably my favorite of these three bonus items. To access the flying broom, you need to head to the big yellow crane next to the VNC tower. The easiest way to do this is to paraglide there from the VNC rooftop, but you can also manually just climb up the crane when you're down there doing the broadcast mission in the first place. Next, all you have to do is look for the glowing shrooms and interact with them several times as they grow bigger and bigger. This will take a good few minutes, by the way. Now, if the mushrooms aren't there for you, your game is glitched. Once you've interacted with the glowing mushrooms enough times, you'll be able to start the Flying Broom Parkour Challenge, and you guessed it, just quit the game in the middle of the challenge, and when you reload your save, the broom will now be in your inventory. Now the Flying Broom is also a reskinned paraglider, but with one key difference, you can now fly upwards. So you can use this to access out of bounds areas or the top of buildings, you don't have to go to the VNC tower and take the elevator anymore, you can just fly directly there, and you'll never have to struggle to act a windmill again. So just a bit of a tip, you might want to get this item as soon as you can, and that way getting the rest of these easter egg items in the video will be significantly easier. Finally, we have the bicycle. Now this one's kind of annoying. You need to start by collecting seven red ducks, all hidden and locked in safes around the game. I'm going to show you the location and the safe combination for each duck right now.
after you've collected all seven ducks, head to this side of the ground level of the VNC tower and look for a bicycle leaning against the building. Interact with the bike to start a parkour challenge. Now this one works a little bit differently to the other items. There is a bike rack next to you where you manually pick up the bikes to use for the challenge. Any bike that you interact with and then leave on the ground is going to be in that exact same location when you just fail the challenge. So ride a bike, fail the challenge, you don't have to quit the game, and then when you respawn, that bike will still be on the ground and you can now interact with it and you can free roam the game while riding it. Now unfortunately, the bicycle doesn't stay in your inventory, so you'll have to initiate the challenge here at the VNC Tower and do it the same way every time that you want to ride the bike. But still, it's pretty fun to zoom around the map and hit some cool jumps. And that wraps up every single secret Easter egg developer item in Dying Light 2, at least the ones that we know of right now. There might be some more still hidden in the game, there might be some more coming in future DLC. Techland does love their Easter eggs, but I hope you found this video useful. Let me know what your favorite item is, and uh, I'll see you in the next video. Cheers, guys!